And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I am the executive editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining our October's installment of the relatively new monthly Dataversity webinar series, Enterprise Data World. This series is designed to give our Enterprise Data World conference attendees education year-round, a conference we've been producing in partnership with Data International now for nearly 20 years. Enterprise Data World will be held this year in Austin, Texas, April 27th through May 4th, 2014. We'll close the call for presentations, and we'll start reviewing uh, those and putting together the agenda before we open registration next month. Today we're discussing a strategic approach to data quality with Laura Sebastian Coleman, who has been both a speaker and attendee at past events. Just a couple points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Let me introduce to you our speaker today, Laura Sebastian Coleman. Laura is a data quality architect at Optum and has worked on data quality in large healthcare data warehouses since 2003. Laura has implemented data quality metrics and reported reporting, launched and facilitated Optum's data quality community, contributed to data consumer training programs, and has led efforts to establish data standards and managing and to manage metadata. In 2009, she led a group of analysts from Optum and United Health Group in developing the original data quality assessment framework, which is the basis for her book, Measuring Data Quality for Ongoing Improvements by Morgan Kaufman. Push, I should say, pushed by Morgan Kaufman. And if you don't know, Dataversity has a partnership with Morgan Kaufman, and, we'll send, and I'll send a, a, everyone the promotional code in the follow-up email for this webinar with, to receive 20% off of Laura's book. So with that, we're very lucky to have her with us today, and I will turn the presentation and the floor over to Laura. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and uh, thanks to everyone who's in attendance. Um, I know our, our time in our jobs is scarce, and I appreciate people choosing to participate in this webinar. I hope it's valuable for you. I have uh, two goals today. One goal is to get participants to think strategically about data quality improvement. And my other goal is to try to provide you with concrete suggestions about actions you can take that will enable you to assess your organization's ability to move forward strategically. So to this, I will give a very brief introduction to my company and to myself. Uh, I'll make an important disclaimer. Uh, then I'm going to review some definitions and, uh, and some assumptions about the concepts I'll be uh, discussing. And, uh, many of you I know work in data governance and know the importance of setting uh, the table with, with, a, with accurate and complete definitions. So we'll take some time on, on that. I'm going to review um, what I've called the 12 directives of data quality strategy. And within each of these, I'll describe the goal of a, an assessment of readiness for that directive, and then, as I said, some concrete things that you can do to start working on that goal. Um, I will uh, try to finish up in a timely manner um, and leave uh, 15 or so minutes so that we can have some discussion at the end. So, uh, as I said, um, I work for Optum. Optum is part of uh, United Health Group, and we are an information, uh, or we are a health information and technology company. So we help uh, people within the healthcare system use technology um, to make that system work better for everyone involved. That is our company's mission. And when when I talk a bit later about the importance of mission um, for a company who wants to move ahead strategically, um, please remember that. Uh, the company that I work for, I think, has a very clear mission, and, and we try to live it. Uh, fairly large, 35,000 people, and Optum uh, solutions interact with, with uh, people all through the healthcare system, from um, you know planning uh, protocols through treatments and the like. So we are hoping that through technology we can uh, improve this overall and deliver health care uh, of higher quality at lower cost. Um, 
as Shannon said, I have uh, over 10 years of experience in as a data quality practitioner. I've, I've worked uh, in the healthcare industry during that time and on the IT side of, of uh, things in industry. So I'll put that forward because I know that sometimes there are questions about who's responsible for data quality. Is it IT? Is it the business side? Um, I personally think that um, technology and data are so important to everything we do in, in healthcare that you can't really, um, can't really separate out um, how the business works from how the data works and how the technology needs to support that. My experience has been largely in data warehousing and therefore that's influenced how I think about quality. Um, but I also have background in banking and manufacturing. I've worked for a distributor and I've also worked in uh, workers' comp, the workers' comp side of, of uh, commercial in insurance. So I bring that to uh, my understanding of what data is, what quality data is, and how we can measure quality. And one one thing that I I conclude from what I've seen is even though we are living in the information age, uh, data is still treated more as a byproduct than it is as a product. That organizations continue to make um, incorrect or sometimes naive assumptions about what data is and how it should work and, and they don't always recognize its complexity and that is one of the things that tends to get um, them into trouble with quality because they have expectations that cannot uh, be met. So that's about myself and my company and I did say I have a disclaimer. And that disclaimer is that the 12 directives that I'll discuss are not new, uh, and I hope that none of them are really surprising. I've synthesized them from some of the thought leaders in data quality and in product quality. Um, and so I'm saying, you know, here's a brand new idea that will change your life. I'm trying to get you to think about how to apply these. I have included um, a bibliography at the in the slide so you can you can uh, get a list there of some of the sources that I rely on when I um, try to grapple some of the challenges that we have with data quality um, the hope is new is that is the is some ideas about how to move forward with directives so that's what I'm, I'm going to be getting at the directives are based on is a set of assumptions of some of the common problems that uh, exist in in organizations that rely on data to get their work done. These include a, an assumption about um, complexity of systems. Systems um, tend to uh, be complex anyway because they're moving a lot of data through them. More organizations have a system that have evolved over time, and oftentimes um, the folks that originally built the system um, are long gone by the time changes are made to the system. So they really have gone through evolution, and very few organizations are rigorous about documentation. So there's a lot of embedded in the system that is really hard to access. You don't always know our systems work the way they work and they are even more complex because of that. The is that our organizations are dispersed and so data is being produced in multiple places and, but, and, and it doesn't always fit together in the ways that we think that, um, that it should. And how we aren't rigorous, most people, most organizations are not rigorous about documentation. We often know about a system but we you know that knowledge is embedded in people's heads and so uh, getting it out and being able to um, share it is a difficult challenge. So I'm, ass I'm assuming that many of us are in that condition. Uh, if anybody's not, contact me after the webinar because I'd like to understand how you've gotten beyond it. So 
So let's start at the beginning with definitions. Um, many organizations talk about strategy, but very few actually do what they mean by it. I like the I like to go back to the origin of the word, which is you know a military word. It is actually the Greek word for generalship. So strategy is about planning for a war, for a set of battles or a set of engagements. And this includes what you accomplish, and then it includes a set of steps to accomplish it or a set of options, really, for accomplishing it. And those are usually referred to as tactics. Um, and there's no logic of tactics. You have a set of decisions you can make, and depending on the outcome at the tactical level, you can move, in, you know, other options may open up. We talk about the difference between strategy and tactics as if, if they're opposition, but they're really in part and parcel of the same thing. So when we talk about tactical success, we, tactical success can only be equal to success if it actually um, enables a strategy to progress. If it doesn't, then you are you know, winning the battle and losing the war. The origins of strategy tell us about what it means to be strategic. It means to be intentional. It means to think about and plan for success in terms of both time and space. And really always need to be asking yourself, if you want to act strategically, you always have to be asking yourself, what do I want to accomplish, when do I want to get it accomplished, why, and how do I do it? How do I move from point A to point B or X or whatever? Those three questions will keep coming up. With business um, or another organization, you know, modern entity, um, when we talk about strategy, we're usually talking about aligning work efforts with the mission or the long-term goals of an organization. So it's about alignment and, and making the right decisions to achieve the goals of a mission. So in order to do that, you have to have a clear vision and mission. You have to understand what your current state is. You need to know where you're starting. And you have a set of plans that move you from that current state to that future state. And we talk about those in terms of, of tactics. So, um, strategy can provide a, a, an organization with criteria through which to make decisions about tactical efforts. And of course, to work, people need to know what it is and they need to actually refer to it when they make those decisions. So this program just tries to put into a picture what I've been saying about the relation between strategy and tactics current state and future state. And that is you always have a strategic direction. That direction always has to be forward looking. And you have a set of plans and depending on the outcome of any one of those sets of plans, you can make a decision about additional plans always with the with future state in mind. So Weakness, I think, and that is that people get all excited about it, and they kind of think it will magically happen. So, and it is, in fact, very uh, exhilarating to have a clear picture of where you're going to want to go. If you don't actually make plans, if you don't understand where you're starting, and if you don't set up the actions that you want to take to get get that future state, then be very disappointed, and you feel like you have a failed strategy. So it doesn't happen all at once. You really do need to plan for it. The planning part is central. Um, so we need to apply the idea of strategy to data. Again, I'll step back for a moment and, and find my terms. I, I think one of the challenge, one of the reasons why um, some organizations have trouble with Data quality is that they don't recognize what they mean by data. And they talk to each other about it. Um, so I've got several definitions here. Um, I won't read them all, but I, I will start with the um, New Oxford American Dictionary definition, which 
define data as facts and statistics collected together for reference or analysis. That is a very um, scientific definition of data, and I think it, it is a valid starting point. When, when I was trying to come up with a definition to, to um, be able to articulate some of the ideas in my book, I ended up making a longer one because I wanted to uh, bring to you the idea that data is abstraction. So it isn't, you know, data is, is being a part of something to represent a whole of things. Um, so we present every single characteristic of real world entities with data. We have to choose which ones we want to represent. So it, it data is formulated and created through a set of choices. It can represent objects, events, concepts. Um, in order to understand this system of representation, they need to be uh, in, in play explicitly defined conventions about what data means, how it's collected, and then in our electronic world, how it is stored and accessed. So when we think about data, we, we know that it is trying to tell us some about the world. It's trying to represent the world in a factual way, but it, it's very formal. We need to understand how it is, how its form is created in order to understand what it is trying to represent and how well it represents that, that thing. Um, so we need to understand data from its origins um, in order to read its quality. And I guess one of the things that gets in the way of our understanding of data is that much data that we, that we work with, we understand. You know, we talk about um, you know, our first name as a data attribute. We, we understand what that means and can even understand how complex it might be when we know that um, in parts of the world, the concept of a first name uh, is, is uh, created differently. So in different cultures, the first name has a different meaning from um, other from what it means in other cultures. So we can understand those concepts, but we take a lot of data for granted and we don't actually lay down how this how did this data get created? Why is it in the shape that it's in and the like? Um, my definitions of data quality are also uh, you know fairly standard. Um, most discussions about data quality, especially those like my, my own that are rooted in the product model of quality say that quality data is fit for the purposes that, that people use it for. Um, but data is also representational. And so we the quality data is also in part um, how well it represents those, those things that it purports to represent. And again, in order to understand the quality, you do need to understand um, data's representational components, how it's created, um, how it's used, those kinds of those kinds of questions. So I would we'll be talking about how to assess the current state of your organization. So it's worth spending a moment on the concept of assessment. Assessment is a kind of measurement, but it goes a step beyond the most basic me measurement. It can things. You have, to you have to have two things to consider in order to measure. But the purpose of assessment is actually to draw a conclusion. Start to talk about a current state assessment. What you're really going to be trying to do is to look as objectively as you can at your organization and make observations and to the extent possible quantify those observations. But in order to draw a conclusion, to, and the conclusion that you want to draw is framed by the relation between your state as objectively described and your future state. So you find out how far away am I from my desired future state and how I move toward it most effectively. So, so we've talked about data, we've talked about strategy, and 
need to say what we mean by a data strategy. And I want to step back in complex organizations, even in smaller organizations, there's a lot of talk about strategies for different components of the organization. So there may be a human resources strategy, there may be a product strategy, a sales strategy. All of those things need to align with the overall mission of the company and they need to not conflict with each other. So if your product strategy is in conflict with your HR strategy, then then you're you're gonna tie within your organization rather than moving forward. So a data strategy one of the goals is to recognize how data supports your overall mission and then a pivot techniques of quality improvement to data in order to uh, get better data that can support that mission. So when we're trying to pull this together, you need to be able to identify actions that will move the organization towards producing higher quality data. And the, the important thing is to get alignment between various groups and, and the various activities that are supporting improved quality. So some organizations have different names for the uh, strategic initiatives associated with technology as well as with other parts of, of their, their um, plan. And whatever names your organization chooses for these and however they may overlap, again, the most important thing is, is that you align and, and don't contradict each other as you're as you're trying to move the organization forward. So the mission again becomes the, the central driver. So this is important. Um, again, coming back to this concept of strategy, we we want to intentionally plan for success. You can sometimes succeed without intentional planning. Uh, but you may even realize you succeeded. <laughs> Whereas if you do if you do intentional planning for um, organizational success, you have better ways of making decisions and you just increase your chance of success. So on to the 12 directives. Um, how of these? They're not a process. I'm not telling you do this thing first, second, third. Um, they are component pieces of what your organization will need to do overall in order to uh, be strategic about uh, quality. Which of these are going to serve your organization best in the short term and in the long term? Um, which ones you should focus on really depend upon where organization is now and what your role is in it. And so you can, there are certain things that you may be able to do as an individual to, uh, to organization moving in this way. And there are other things where you may need, you know, the direct support of other people. And so, you know, you need to give some thought to which of these and how to leverage each of these. These are also not uh, they're not, they are very much in, interconnected. So they're, you know, if you, um, if you want, for example, to get management commitment to data quality, to data quality efforts, um, you all need to work on uh, management about data as an asset. Two will work very closely together. Uh, because if management sees data as an asset and, and you can get some numbers around that, then they're much more likely to provide the support you need for data quality improvements, the two hand in hand. So these break up into three sets. The, the first set is that you, you recognize the importance of data to the organization's mission. So directive one says to obtain management commitment to data quality. And the, the, the goal of assessing the current state management commitment to data quality is 
to identify any obstacles to uh, moving the management in that direction and also to identify um, opportunities through which you could develop that commitment. So part of what you need to assess is how your company's management actually works. And you can do that through things like uh, reviewing business plans and, and either formally or informally surveying the management team with a set of questions that, that allows you to understand what it takes to get them to commit to anything and so specifically to the data quality efforts. The other thing that is really important when you're trying to obtain uh, management commitment to data quality is to be able to to speak the language of strategy in relation to data. So your, your company's mission should drive the business uses of data, and you should be able to relate the business uses of data directly to your organization's mission. If your organization does not have a clear mission, if they do not currently have a clear strategic direction, then your job here is much, much harder than it will be if you're working in an organization where they do have a clear overall mission and, and you can relate data to it. It's not, it's not impossible. Um, and in fact, you know, it's easier if, they, if you already have strategic thinkers. But if you're starting um, an organization that isn't thinking strategically, then you have an opportunity to contribute to that effort as well. And you, you can use um, improvement of data quality as a, as a way of illustrating the benefits of a strategic plan. The directive is to treat data as an asset to begin to do this. There's kind of two, uh, two, for, uh, two times in this fork. Um, one is to understand how your company currently talks about the value of data and to, to move the company toward talking about the value of data in comprehensible terms, which usually means you know, how much uh, monetary value do we get out of our data or what monetary value could we potentially get out of, your, out of our data. Your company is not talking in these terms at all, then you can um, look at the other assets that your company values and determine how do they put value on other assets that aren't directly on the general ledger. And use that as a model for talking about data. You can also get some hard numbers by looking at the amount of uh, investment that the company makes in data, whether through projects or through the cost of mediating issues or um, through the uh, investment in technology. Um, you do some scenario planning. So you can um, take some of the ideas about how data directly relates to your company mission and you can uh, work out what is the best case for data supporting the company mission and what is the worst case of the data. You know, what if something were to go terribly wrong with this data? What impact would that have on our company mission? And you can then uh, present the, uh, in terms of the benefits of improving data quality and the risks of um, allowing poor quality data to exist within the organization. And if you are in a position to do a pilot project, you want to take one of these opportunities and define a pretty thorough cost-benefit analysis and tie it directly to uh, the company's mission. So two uh, directives related to recognizing recognizing the importance of data to the company's mission are to apply resources to focus on quality. Um, if in the long run your company is not willing to, um, your organization is not willing to apply resources to improve quality, then all the, 
the strategic thinking will not really get out of the gate. So how do you move the company in this direction? You want to understand the readiness that the company has to formally engage a team. Um, so one new approach to this is to assess how the organization responds to data issues. And you can find out a lot of information about this through things like help desk tickets or incident reports or break fix projects and give you um, information on uh, the costs involved, but also can give you information on how decisions are made about where, to, where and when to apply resources. You can also conduct a survey of teams that um, may have the name data quality, but who are in one way or another working data and trying to make the data better. And if you do, you will you will get an idea of what the problems are that will allow you to build out the value of data and, and the like. But you also identify areas of redundancy. You identify um, where people may be working across purposes. Um, so you can be looking for uh, potential efficiencies if a if a team were formed specifically to um, be responsible for monitoring and measuring data quality. And as was described, uh, you know, under Directive Two, uh, looking at budgets, um, understanding investment in data management and in technology, those things will allow you to put the value of data in monetary terms. Um, the first directive here under recognizing the importance of data is to build explicit knowledge of the data. As I said earlier, I think most organizations are not disciplined about how they build this knowledge. Um, because of that, a lot of knowledge is lost and people struggle to answer questions about data. So if you want to move your company toward better knowledge management practices. You need to understand how people currently share knowledge um, and understand how well that knowledge sharing is working. So if they are working well, then by all means, celebrate them and use them as models for potential improvements. If things are not working well, then find out how people work around those things. So how do they, if, if there's a, if the knowledge gap is how do people fill it. And you can provide some concrete analysis of the condition of your systems documentation, of the condition of your metadata, um, to, to say, you know, illustrate to um, your management team where there are gaps and why these gaps create risks. The set of gives is concerned with how to apply concepts that um, have been defined within uh, data quality, how to, just, how to apply those to data quality. So first of these directives is, is probably the, the statement that is um, most often due to in discussions of uh, data quality improvement, and that is to treat data as a product of processes would be measured and improved. So how do we begin to do this? The first is to understand the degree which your organization already treats data as a as a product um, and then to assess the processes that create data in order to identify opportunities within that production process to improve the quality of data produced in the organization. One of the um, important things in this kind of activity is to understand whether there is any documentation of current processes, you know, how your data chain formed, and um, if, if there is documentation, then identify gaps. Um, again, celebrate the fact that there is documentation if, if it exists. Um, 
the other thing is to survey for business and IT leaders uh, and, stake, and other stakeholders about the addition of the data and put an emphasis on their knowledge of the interaction between systems. So you may find that people are confident about the data in, in one system, but then lose confidence outside of that system. And they lose confidence for a range of reasons. Sometimes they know one system much better than another. Other times they um, know that the data is different and they are more familiar with the data in one system rather than another. So you need to be focusing, as you, as you think about that as a product, you need to be focusing on the way it moves through the organization and where people, um, where people understand it and where they don't. Um, and you do find examples where um, processes are well defined and data quality is measured, then find out how they got to be the way that they are. And, and use those as a model for other uh, improvement opportunities. The uh, directive here, again, is very familiar that the quality of data is defined by data consumers. Uh, we often talk about product quality in terms of, you know, the customer defines what, what is right. Um, to understand how to move your your organization towards defining, towards enabling consumers to really define what they mean by quality, you need to find data consumers and you need to ask them directly about the condition of the data and you need to find out from them which data is most important to them so that you can understand where they are coming from in terms of quality. Um, so you can survey them directly you can also find objective information about data access and use through um, access logs and again review of things like help desk tickets or issue tickets um, so that you can find which problems cause the most pain for your data consumers. Second set of directives is, or, or sorry, the final two directives in this set are that you should address the root causes of data problems and that you should measure and monitor critical data. So when you talk about addressing the root cause of data problems, again, this is a, a question of your company's cultural orientation to solving problems in general. So how, do, how does your organization solve problems, you know, of any sort, not necessarily related to um, yeah. how do they work together, what kinds of behaviors get in the way of solving problems, um, and which ones enable the organization to uh, solve problems. And you, again, can find a example um, where you can produce a cost-benefit analysis on, a, on the remediation of a problem at its root cause, then be able to show that example to others in the company and begin to build a case for remediation of root causes rather than um, remediation of just symptoms. Um, if your organization does tend to treat the symptoms and not the root cause, then there, there is a bit of work in trying to reorient them. Um, and then, uh, finally, within this is to measure the quality of data um, and then monitor critical data. So you understand whether the company currently does do a data quality measurement, and if so, what's been successful and why. If you're not currently measuring the quality of data, then I, then I would suggest you look at how your company measures other uh, of quality um, characteristics of their products or of their processes, and again, try to uh, understand from a from the perspective of cultural behaviors how you might be able to apply a successful measurement um, measurement approaches to data. Um, 
the data quality assessment framework, which um, is outlined in my book, provides a range of ways that you can measure data and that you could uh, produce uh, a um, cost-benefit analysis for um, a pilot project or uh, a proposal to uh, move forward with uh, tackle data quality uh, activities. The third set of directives um, are aimed at building a culture based on quality and is uh, ready to strategically manage its data. The directive hold producers accountable for the quality of, of data, tie back to your knowledge of the data chain. And you need to understand your company's general approach to accountability. You need to understand the data chain in order to identify ways that you can uh, improve the relationship between pieces of the data chain. So you may be able to identify um, gaps in communication. You may be able to identify uh, opportunities if um, if your company responds well to um, performance a review goals and can incorporate and you can move towards incorporating um, quality goals into performance evaluations, then you can you can give people a direct incentive to be accountable for the quality of their data. Um, direct ten is to provide data consumers with knowledge that they require for uh, data use. And again, this ties back to moving toward uh, a more knowledge-based use uh, or a more knowledge-based approach to data quality. You need to understand how well data consumers are currently informed about, about um, the meaning of data and the production data. You can the same kinds of assessments that are described in Directive 4 and Directive 6 um, to understand how much time is spent uh, if the knowledge is not available in a direct way. And then you can ask them, what would be the best way to improve your ability to understand the data? The final two directives uh, bring us back to Planning, strategic planning, and also to the overall emphasis on cultural change necessary to Im actually implement a data quality strategy. The two go hand in hand. So, as you're thinking about the future of data in your company, you need to be understanding the potential future in your industry, um, and need to understand or your, your organization needs to understand how to prepare for the future, not only in terms of data, but also in terms of, of their systems and in terms of the activities that they want um, to engage in to, to fulfill the mission. So identifying major trends and identifying the risks with the existing uh, apparatus, your, your technology and your data, um, can help you identify potential future risks. And by identified a set of risks, you have a basis for planning to mitigate them or uh, take steps to, to eliminate those risks altogether. So um, with Directive 11, the, many of you are probably familiar with the book, um, The Art of the Long View, and this really, um, concepts there for looking at best and worst case sets within an industry be applied uh, not only to at the industry level but also at the data level. And finally, all, all of these suggestions we amount to trying to move your organization culturally toward a focus on producing better quality data in order to meet your company's mission. I'm at every opportunity throughout, if you engage in activities related to any of these direct directives, 
more consistently you can make that connection between your company's mission and the data you produce, the stronger argument you will have for um, making the kinds of decisions that will improve the quality of your data over time. So from these current state assessments, you are going to want you are going to discover a number of things. If you do even one of these, you're going to find out something about what data is most important and what's less important. Find out which processes are working well and which aren't. And you're going to get some insight on the behaviors in your company that support strategic movement and the behaviors that may get in the way of strategic movement and of, of improvement. Quality. And you need, you need to sit down and the results and synthesize them into a set of prioritized recommendations and a proposal for how to implement them. And in in most cases, I most most of us do not work alone. And and work like this, uh, I think a collaborative approach is really beneficial because you can get multiple perspectives. And if you've got a small team who were in a position to review the results of even one of these assessments, let's say you know you go through all your help desk tickets in to identify patterns in um, kinds of problems that you that are present in your data. Have multiple perspectives will give you a deeper level of insight about ways of solving the problems themselves and also moving your company forward within uh, the context of its mission. So I turn to this about, about strategy just as a reminder that you need to start where you're at, you need to understand where you want to be, and then you need to make decisions based on can move you toward where you want to be. Is that the end of my full slides? And as I said, I wanted to make sure that um, we had uh, 15 minutes or so to have um, conversation. So, Shannon, um, do you want to um, want to facilitate the Q and A? And we already have a couple of questions come in. Uh, just a reminder to everyone uh, that to submit the questions in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And one of the most popular questions that always comes up is, uh, will people be getting a copy of the slides? And just a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the webinar, along with anything else requested throughout the day. And Laura, so the first question that came in is, could you expand how data has a uh, quote unquote shape. You know, um, we 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 talk about data structure and we use that term structure, we are really referring quickly to tables in which data is stored. Uh, but I think that data has shape even before we put it into tables. So um, let's take um, all of you know, if, if data is a representation of characteristics of real-world objects, then and, a, and and you as an individual person are a real-world object, a real-world object, then you have different choices about how you can represent yourself. Um, you can present yourself using just your your name, you know, your first name or your First and last name. You include a title. You could describe, um, you know, physical characteristics: how tall you are, uh, how much you weigh, what color your hair is. You know, those kinds of things. You have you use all of those things to represent yourself. So, in some contexts, you may use a small or larger subset of those things to represent yourself. If you if you are you know, going to the library to get a book out, you can hand your library card over and get that book and probably ask any questions. But if you want to um, fly on a 
an international flight, you need to have you know your passport and other uh, data about you. You're the same person, but the context is different, and you need to represent yourself differently in those different situations. So the decisions about how to represent ourselves or how to represent any object give, give data a shape. And, you know, as I said, the selection of which attributes to represent is, is in part what I mean by the shape of data. Does that sense? Just to me, and um, we can ask the questioner. If, if you make a little note to me, I'll, we can ask Laura to expand that. Um, but on, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Laura, what are, what are the size and roles within your data quality organization? Yeah, so um, I have a team of, um, up until re very recently, three direct reports, and we um, we have responsibility for uh, implementing many projects, uh, monitoring the results of ongoing measurements, and um, providing um, guidance for uh, implementation projects and providing uh, guidance for the development of metadata. We, you know, we have a team of the four of us. Uh, there are different ways that data quality efforts can be organized um, within an IT uh, world. And so we have traditional IT roles like you know, business analysts who are responsible for defining requirements and then our developers who, who actually write the code and our QA people who, um, who do testing. So our team is really very much focused on um, measurement part of data quality. Uh, next question is, can you expand on how you were successful in getting the organization excited about recognizing data as an asset? Yeah, um, you know, throughout the 12 directives, I, I, I've, I've noted that if you can come up with an example or if you can um, show a cost benefit, then you are going to get a better response. And I'll tell a short story here. When I when I first started, uh, my boss, you know, took me in the first day and said, well, "Your job is to figure out how to measure data quality and report on it." So I got to know the warehouse and I talked to people about what the challenges were and and what they thought of quality and the like. And started with a very small set of measurements. There were four of these measurements, and I requested that. Um, I said that uh, you know we got we would get these minutes automated, and very few people saw value in automating the measurements. Um, nevertheless, I moved ahead, and we had alerts associated with the measurements. So the the first time that I got an alert on the measurement, um, I went to my boss and then we went to the um, manager in charge of our ETL, immediately assessed that we did have a big problem that, that he took action on immediately and he um, started ETL process. And uh, we looked at projects that had been uh, put in place to do the same, you know, to fix some problems and we saw that even the instance of such a project would be, you know, a three hundred fifty thousand dollar fix. So, I, when I actually did that analysis and said, "Wow, the last time we fixed this problem, you know, it cost us three hundred fifty thousand dollars," but he looked at me in a different way. <laughs> it was a very hard number, very concrete uh, benefit of having that measurement in place, and and so there there's a sense. That okay, we have we know that people need this data to do their jobs, and know that we we have just saved the the x number of dollars. 
and we could apply that to other parts of our warehouse, and, and we did. And people began to turn um, to see that we had more control over the quality of data than we had previously thought we had. And, and then that made them see it as not something that just got shoved into the database, but, but they said it's the real, the real thing that people really wanted, what people really needed was the data. And, say, and the, just along those lines and, and a nice progression, are you using any third-party tools to measure data quality? Um, we are not using third-party tools. Uh, the measurements that we have in place for the, I should say, for inline measurement, we're not using third-party tools. We have processes to collect data inline um, to uh, to um, do a set of comparisons so that we can determine whether the data is consistent with past results or consistent with defined thresholds. I am not aware of a third-party tool that does measure data quality in line in the, in the way that our, we wanted to do it. We do use um, a profiling engine to do initial assessment of data. and. Um, but not, but not in line stuff that we had to build. Um, do we a full structure with committee and other forums separated from data governance committee for to discuss data quality issues and dashboards? So I I really think that data quality and data governance are so intertwined. Um, but a lot of work work to do in, in both areas. <laughs> so I would say you need to look at your organization and you need, you need to understand where you're starting in terms of either data quality or data governance or both. Um, if your organizational vocabulary emphasizes data governance and people are they are committed to that. In all means, use that commitment to uh, as a means of, of um, get movement on improving the quality of data. If people are talking in terms of data quality, and you can you can use that commitment. It, you are more successful if you have um, the the components that are often associated with. Data governance. So when I say you know build a culture committed to data quality, one doing that is through having a strong data governance organization where you have stewards who you know um, are paying attention to the quality of the data and they know the data really well um, and and they uh, know what's what's most important and what the repercussions are if something goes wrong. So I see the two is very much connected. Um, Sometimes people try to separate them. Sometimes people try to put one above other. I think it, the important thing is not theoretically was first, but within your organization, how can you use the concepts associated with data governance and the concepts associated with data quality to make, make your organization more successful? And that goes, and I'm, I'm just looking, sorry, I'm looking at the other part of the question there. And, and uh, I, think I with, with formal structures and, and how to set up committees and such, I, can, I, I tend to, to think vision through from the perspective of your culture and, your, and how your organization works best. There's not a magical um, committee structure for uh, data governance. You to work with with what you have, and then bring in best practices that are most suitable for for your organization culturally. And just right along those lines, Laura, does data validation fall under the umbrella of data quality management, or is that a function under quality assurance? On the way. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it for that it sort of depends where that's happening within the software development life cycle. If you're developing um, 
you know, software and you have a QA team that can, then they, I think they should, as part of that, should be validating the, the data as well, because how else can you tell if the software is producing expected results? But we have processes with our assets, you know, assets that have already been signed off by quality assurance and, and are in place, where we do um, val validity checks on the data uh, on an ongoing basis. And I'm afraid that brings us right to the top of the hour. There are some fantastic questions, and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to them all. But I want to thank everyone, and Laura, thank you for this great presentation, and thanks everyone for attending today. Um, just a reminder, I will send out a link to the slides and the recording uh, from this session within two business days, so by end of day Thursday. Laura, again, thank you so much. This was really fantastic. But, and, and I appreciate it. And everybody for all the great interaction and all the great questions, and uh, that just makes it off it. So, again, I'll get that email out to everyone, and I hope everyone has a great day. Bye. Bye.